Hi, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Packers Unscripted from Packers.com. I am Mike Spofford, joined, as always, by my partner in crime, Weston Hodkowitz. We're coming to you here from our studios at Lambeau Field. And finally, Wes, able to talk about a Packers victory for the first time in six weeks. 31-28, to a thriller in overtime over the Dallas Cowboys at Lambeau Field. And we don't have a whole lot of time to talk about it because there's another game right around the corner here Thursday night coming up at home. And we have to cover that in this show as well. But we will start with reviewing this victory that snapped a five-game losing streak for Green Bay. The Packers were down 14 at the start of the fourth quarter, staring a six-game losing streak in the face. But both sides of the ball stepped up, made the plays when they had to make them, got the victory, and Green Bay is hoping that this will start to turn around its season yeah I mean a gotta have them moment uh as as must win as it probably gets for a team in early November the most impressive part of this thing though Mike is it wasn't the defense it wasn't the offense it wasn't special teams it was the collective pulling together to get a much needed victory the Green Bay Packers don't win this game if they don't have the two minutes stop by the defense they don't have being able to stop Dallas on its first possession of overtime. In scoring territory, too. In scoring territory. Yeah. They don't get this win if the offense doesn't rally, if Christian Watson doesn't get two of his three touchdowns, if Christian Watson in the fourth quarter, if he doesn't end up converting a touchdown on a fourth down situation, they don't get this win. They don't get this win if Mason Crosby in the field goal unit doesn't kind of rally there after a few miscues early on in the game to, to get the game winner after Alan Lazard breaks the slant into a 36-yard gain. It was about team football. In the Green Bay Packers, when you listen to Matt LaFleur, when you hear him both at the podium and also with his locker room speech, Mike, that was a passionate, passionate man that believes in his football team and even though Green Bay was 3-6 and six going into this thing, they still felt like they are a championship-caliber team that has underperformed at this point. I thought Sunday, when they had to have it, the guys responded. And certainly an emotional victory that you had to immediately put in your back pocket <laughs> because you have the Tennessee Titans looking at your face here on Thursday night. Yeah, absolutely. A tremendous release of emotion, though, in, in so many ways with regard to finally snapping this losing streak. But you said it, Wes. You hit on... A couple of the of of the key moments, and when you when you look back at why the Packers have piled up the losses that they have, and why it took them so long to get a win, you know you're you're knocking on the door for the tying score in London in the fourth quarter, right? You don't get the job done. What was it? A, a third and nine or a third and twelve in Washington, right? Where Heineke, you know, completes the pass by the sideline to Terry McLaurin. That was essentially the ball game because the Packers are down two. If you can get the stop there, you get it back. You get a you know you get a chance. You don't make the play. You're first and ten on the 17 yard line for everything that went wrong in Detroit. You're first and ten on the 17 yard line, down by six points with enough time to score the winning touchdown, and you don't get it done in the clutch moments. What was this game? It was fourth and seven, down by 14. It was fourth and three in overtime when the Cowboys decide to pass on the field goal go for the first down, pass on the long field goal, would have yeah. been, I believe, a 53-yarder. They decide to go for the first down, and the defense gets that stop on fourth and three. It's third and short, and the play-action slant to Al Lazard. It's making the plays in the key moments. That is the di You can talk about game plans and play calling and all this kind of stuff. It's about making it happen in the key moments, and the Packers were able to do that on Sunday when they hadn't been able to do that for the previous five weeks, and, and that's the difference between wins and losses in this league. And a big gut check, too, because you see a guy like Christian Watson who, again, had more receiving yards in that game than he'd had all season you know, due to injuries and opportunities and everything. Being able to come back after that scare uh, you know, a week earlier and, and step up in a big way for an offense that needed it. When he completed that first 58-yard touchdown pass, I think Aaron Rodgers at that point had 15 passing yards. Um, they ran the ball well against loaded boxes. Uh, Aaron Jones and A.J. Dillon, in concert with one another, looked really good. Defensively, they had to stitch this thing together. I mean, they lost Eric Stokes. So then you have Darnell Savage playing in the slot for an extended period of time for really the first time. Rudy Ford on the back end, who had one interception in his career before Sunday, leaves Lambeau Field with two more. 
Um, th- there just were so many areas where guys stepped up. And when you think about the best Packers teams that we've covered, both underneath Matt LaFleur and Mike McCarthy, it's where they've had complimentary players step up and fill voids, not just your superstars. And when you lose Rashawn Gary, when you don't have Romeo Dobbs, when you've taken as many hits as they took a week earlier in Detroit, somebody else has to be the guy that, that carries that water. And the thing, honestly, Mike, that I was most impressed with with this game is, and I wrote this in Insider Inbox, the Packers have had games where defensively they looked great on a, on a stat sheet. You know, they, the passing yards were low. Maybe they, you know, the, the rushing yards weren't too bad. But ultimately, when they need to make a stop, they didn't make it. This game, if you look at the box score, you see Dallas put up over 400 total yards. Right. But in terms of the sniff test, in terms of the eye test, when you watched it, that was a really good defensive effort by Green Bay. Third quarter got away from them a little bit, but they were able to get stops when they needed to. And also, by making Dallas run 79 offensive plays, in not rupturing for explosives, that's ultimately what allowed them to get some takeaway opportunities. It was how you draw it up for the Green Bay Packers, and I thought overall a very complete performance, all things considered. Yeah, you talk about a defense that that started strong early in the game and finished strong late. There were some things certainly that got away in the middle of the game, and Amari Rogers' fumbled punt was a huge momentum shift, and that was unfortunate because the Packers' defense had stopped Dallas when they were backed up on the five-yard line, stopped them, got the three and out. The score is tied there early third quarter, 14-all. But Amari Rodgers fumbles the punt. Dallas gets the ball right back. And before you can blink your eyes, Dallas turns that momentum shift into two touchdowns, and suddenly it's 28-14. to But this defense, it was strong early. It did rise up in a, I mean, a huge moment after yeah. – Aaron Rodgers had uh, suffered the sack fumble on his own 10-yard line. Dallas was already up 7 nothing at that point in the second quarter, looking to add to that. And then on third and goal from the 11, Rudy Ford cuts in front of Dalton Schultz at the goal line, gets that, uh, gets that first interception. Then on Dallas' next possession, Rudy Ford gets another interception on a third down pass over the middle. Similar type of thing, but this one was more of a downfield throw towards C.D. Lamb, but he undercuts that one as well. Big returns on both of them for Ford, and the Packers end up converting both of those turnovers into touchdowns. The Packers had 14 points off of takeaways all season long through the first nine games. In game 10, you get 14 points off of two takeaways to to double that season total, so a lot going on there. Christian Watson, you mentioned it, and if this weren't a truly unscripted show, I would have our producer Marvin go back and call up my monologue from last week on what Christian Watson needs to do and how important he is yeah. for this offense and what he can mean to it. We saw it. It came, to, it came to fruition. His speed is something that teams have to deal with. And if you are going to try to cover Christian Watson with that speed one-on-one on the outside because you are concerned about A.J. Dillon and Aaron Jones running the ball at you between the tackles, you have to be able to make defenses pay for that. And Christian Watson is the guy that can make you pay because of that speed, and he did that. The 58-yard touchdown, the 39-yard touchdown on fourth and seven, those were pure speed. Yep. And then he had the athleticism, the hands and everything to be able to, to, be able to make the catches. With, uh, um, with regard to running the ball, though, you had said it. The Packers ran the ball into some loaded boxes. They stayed committed to it. And we saw in the second half, A.J. Dillon busted a 17-yard run. Aaron Jones busted a 23-yard run. It's when you, when, you have, when you have that commitment to it and you pound away and pound away, even though you want to get the explosive plays. And, yes, the explosive plays in the passing game are important. But the explosive plays in the running game can happen when a defense gets tired, when a defense gets worn down. And I thought the Packers uh, took advantage of that in uh, in big moments against the Cowboys. In the Spofford, let's be real moment of the week, that it isn't just the big plays the run game you know creates because certainly you want to rupture that. Certainly you want to make the second, third level of the Cowboys defense think a little bit. But it's looking at those third and short opportunities. Why do shot plays largely work, Mike? Not, not because, oh, well, the, the receiver beat his guy and they got a big completion. No, it's because of what the defense is having to account for worrying that you're going to run the ball against third and one. I look at that play with Alan Lazard in overtime, and Lazard talked about it after the game. 
that probably doesn't work the way it worked if it wasn't for the Packers running the ball the way they did. Absolutely. Because ultimately, Lazard was able to catch the slant. Maybe it would have been a first down regardless. But with the way that Dallas was playing them, that's what allowed the middle of the field to come open for Lazard. And ultimately, you get down to the 20-yard line, whatever it was, and then you have the five-yard run by Aaron Jones. He gets a, There's a personal foul out of bounds, and Mason Crosby goes out there for the game winner. The Packers were able to build the offense and their tempo off of the commitment to the run. And credit to that offensive line, playing together all every snap for the first time this season, I believe. Zach Tom did not have to even step on the field in this game. Right. Same same starting lineup for the first time in back to back weeks, weeks, right? For for the Packers on the offensive line. That that is a huge factor as well in terms of what you feel you can hang your hat on offensively and go to in the key moments. In 64 offensive snaps, all five offensive linemen played that. You saw them throughout the game, Mike, getting more and more comfortable. I think you see Yash Nyman and, and John Runyon now on the right side. Every week they've been improving. We got to see David Bakhtiari pulling again on a stretch play. That was a hallmark of the offense when Bakhtiari before this knee injury. And then for Jones to cut up defenses the way he is and it allowing things to open up for A.J. Dillon, just that was the most impressive thing to me. Kind of like with Rudy Ford's interception defensively with everything that happened late, it kind of got lost in the wash a little bit. The way the Packers ran the ball, when you have those big completions yeah. to Watson, something that probably didn't get talked about nearly enough. Yeah, my, my favorite statistic of, of, of many interesting to statistics to look at from this game, but my favorite one is the fact that the Packers' two touchdown drives – in the fourth quarter to tie the game, covered 165 yards yeah. on those two drives. When you're down by 14 in the fourth quarter, 70 of those 165 yards were on the ground. How often does that happen in a, in a multi-score fourth quarter comeback that a team gets almost half of its yardage on multiple scoring drives on the ground? The, the, the commitment to the ground game and the way the way the Packers' offensive linemen, as you said, were kind of they kind of kept feeling it as as the game was going on, and then you were able to to uh, to bust a couple of big ones in the fourth quarter. There, I thought that was uh, I thought that was outstanding. The other statistic I really liked too that I went through and figured this out: the cowboy the Cowboys were five out of fifteen going back to the Packers' defensive performance here. Cowboys were five out of fifteen on third downs yeah. in the game. Three of those five third down conversions were one, one, and two yards. When the Cowboys needed three yards or more on third down, they were two out of 12. Yeah. The Packers' third down defense in this game. Now, a couple of those ended up being fourth and ones, and, and you know, Dak Prescott did the you know, quarterback sneak to convert. But two out of 12 on third downs when you know, it was three yards or more to go, Packers defense did, again, I just go back to saying it, in the clutch moments when you have to have it, the Packers defense did a pretty darn good job. And, uh, and the fact that both of Rudy Ford's interceptions, stepping in as a starting safety with Darnell Savage moving to the slot in the nickel defense, both of the interceptions come on third down, right? I mean, that, uh, that's how you have to play to win, especially against a team like the Cowboys that is, you know, has major playoff and potential Super Bowl aspirations. They came in here... Six and two, riding high, coming off a bye week. They're like, all right, we're rested up. They didn't have Zeke Elliott, but they pretty much had the rest of their uh, yeah. the rest of their cast, and uh, and they were they were loaded for bear. And the Packers took every shot they delivered. Well, and let's be honest. I mean, certainly there were some ruptures there in the middle with the we talked about the draw plays that Tony Pollard was able to get some yards on. But yeah. the fact of the matter is, Mike, we can say it because we don't work for the Dallas Cowboys. Um, Tony Pollard could be a starting running back at a lot of NFL teams right oh, now. Oh, absolutely. Um, the, the, the Cowboys have one of the biggest celebrity backs in the league and Zeke for good reason. But the way it, Pollard has emerged, I mean, it's created a lot of tough questions for them this year. And I thought this game showed that he can be a bell cow if you need him to be 100, whatever it was. I think he had 115. 50, yeah, yeah, 115 yards. It's not by accident. He's yeah. a talented and a lot man. of those a lot of those were on draw plays. The Packers kept getting the Cowboys into second and long, either by a good first down stop or maybe a penalty in a second and long situation. But then they weren't ready for the draw play. And Joe Barry even said on Monday when he spoke to the media, it kind of infuriated him the way 
the way because it, because he felt it was it was an execution thing with regard to the second level, the linebackers yeah. and safeties in terms of who fits where to stop the you know you're you're very rarely going to stop a draw play at the line of scrimmage, but they're running a draw play because it's long yardage. Yes. If you make that tackle just four or five yards downfield, you take that as a win. The Packers weren't doing that, and those those, those draw plays it, were working. Honestly, it's a good. Not, not, they're going to get hit it a different way with the run this week. We'll talk about in a second. But yeah. It is a good learning lesson for them of the importance of that because some of those third and short opportunities that we talked about where Dak ended up doing some sneaks, a lot of those are created off of second and really favorable second and you know three minus you know like so that's going to be where they're going to have to short up. But I will say from the pass defense perspective, Ceedee Lamb got some yards there, but for the most part, considering the big adjustment they made there, I was really impressed by how the secondary played. I mean, Jair Alexander's at the peak of his powers right now. Um, you know, completely shut down Michael Gallup when he was against him. Lamb moved to the slot a little bit, had some success. But the fact is that that was a big switch up they made there. Rudy Ford had played a little bit this season, but not a lot, mostly only in the dime package or when guys were hurt. Savage going to the slot. You saw some of the blitzing options they did with Savage. I think you're going to have to get a little bit more creative with moving forward with how you go about pass rushing without a Rashawn Gary. Yeah, Barry said that as well yeah. on Monday. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, that's that's going to be a part of this thing too, and, you know, guys are stepping up. I mean, Jaron Reed, you talked about him from the intro, three quarterback hits in this game. I mean, that's that's what you're going to need. You're going to need guys that maybe aren't typically your, your pass rushers, aren't typically the stack guys, you know, being able to get you some production. Yeah, my what you might have missed uh, uh, put together several film clips on Jaron Reed sort of showing how – his second half performance was building up to him making that big play Absolutely. on fourth down there, fourth and three in overtime. So we do have to turn the page to the next game, though, because it is coming up awfully quickly. So I'll take care of some sponsor business before we do that. Sirius XM NFL Radio delivers hard-hitting analysis and up-to-the-minute NFL news that true football fanatics need 24-7, 365. And at Cousin Subs, we have something for everyone, like our Wisconsin cheese curds, mac and cheese, golden fries, and creamy shakes, all paired with your favorite sub or sub in a bowl, Cousin Subs, 50 years of better. All right, the Tennessee Titans are up next. It will be Thursday night football at Lambeau Field. The color rush white, all white uniforms, right? The Packers are going to be wearing those? I believe so. That's my understanding. Nothing official yet, but yeah. That's my understanding. <laughs> that's, that's, well, that's the way it's looking. <laughs> All right. Well, you alluded to it earlier. Derrick Henry, the big, powerful running back. What, what was, uh, I think, Matt LaFleur used, he, said, he called him both a creature and a freak of nature. There's a poem to be there's a poem to be put together with Do some that. Rhyming so like, with that. Joe Barry Joe Barry called him Preston Smith. Looks like Preston Smith like coming out of the huddle. Too. That was pretty good too. Derrick Henry, nine hundred and twenty three yards, nine touchdowns in nine games. The math is pretty easy there. That's about hundred yards a game and one touchdown every week for Derrick Henry. He's averaging four point six yards a carry. I think the really intriguing thing in this matchup is this bell cow back in Derrick Henry coming in while on the other side, the Packers have their one-two punch that has produced over 200 yards rushing in two of the last three ball games. The, uh, the, the Detroit game, Packers were not successful running the ball and got away from it. But by and large, over the, in, in recent weeks, the Packers have found some rhythm with their running game. Yep. So it makes, makes for an interesting matchup here in this one. Uh, a big difference, though, being the Packers statistically have had a lot more trouble stopping the run than the Titans. The Titans ranked, uh, I believe, second in the league in uh, in rushing yards per game allowed. So, be interesting to see how this plays out. But uh, um, but you know, the Titans are gonna the Titans are gonna feed Derrick Henry and make the Packers stop him. And even if they stop him for a quarter and a half, or two quarters, or two, and even three and a half. Derrick Henry is still going to get the football all night long on Thursday. The other thing that Joe Barry said during his Monday news conference was tackling plan. You have to have a tackling plan for how you approach Henry, and that is so true because it isn't just going to be one guy. You have a running back that is bigger than most inside linebackers. You have a running back that you do not want to see at the third level with the secondary. You have a guy that must be gang tackled by everybody on the field. And ultimately, as Barry also said, the first film he watched this week – was going back to that 2020 game against the Tennessee Titans before he was the D.C. But, Mike, everything that you just talked about, your one last look everything, the Packers accomplished that in that game against the Titans. 
And it was one of the more impressive performances of the season. Yeah. You know, Henry still got his. He just came a yard short or two yards short of 100 yards. But Green Bay kind of out Tennessee, Tennessee in that game. You know, AJ Dillon had to step up, had his first hundred yard performance. That that's that's his that's his career best game and, and it came at night in the cold, yeah. right? I mean it, there's there's a lot of things maybe lining up here. And the other thing is I wish this is where we don't really have much time because of how the week went, but I wish I could actually watch more of what Denver did because you know, Ijeru Everu is gonna end up being a head coach in this league with what he's done in Denver. Offensively, Broncos really struggling. But Everett has been such a great hire for them with the defensive side of things. They stopped Derrick Henry last week. Now, I can't give you a bowl-by-blow blow on how they did it. They yeah. obviously have one of the best defenses in football. Yeah, and, and Henry, Henry was on a streak of five consecutive 100-yard rushing performances, including one of those that was over 200 yards, and, uh, and the Denver Broncos shut him down. But the fact that, you know, 17-10, to 10, I mean, it, it just shows you again that if you can contain him, if you, you are able to kind of harness his production a little bit, you know, Tennessee has been a really interesting football team this year, Mike. You mentioned, you know, second against the run defensively, but they're 31st against the pass. Right. You mentioned that, you know, what they've done in some of these situations, but, you know, their third down defense is good. Their fourth down defense is the worst in the NFL. Like, it's a very bizarre football team, and their strength of schedule hasn't been great. They've won a lot of games. They've beaten teams they need to beat, but I think there still are a lot of question marks. Now they played Kansas City incredibly tough. You you tip with, your cap with to them. the rookie backup quarterback as well. Ryan Tannehill was not Absolutely. in that game, and they yeah they they had they had a fourth quarter lead on Kansas City at Arrowhead, and uh, Patrick Mahomes was able to you know bring Kansas City back and pull that game out in overtime. But that was that was an impressive performance by uh, by a somewhat undermanned yeah. Tennessee team on the road. So my message this week, you know, if I'm Matt Lafleur, is you beat one of the best teams in football last week. You're going to face another really accomplished team this week. But who says you can't, you know, surprise the world again? And if you're able to do it, Mike, then you're going to Philly, which now has their first loss of the season. This is a long year. Yeah. It's the reason why Matt LaFleur always says you can't get too high or too low on these things because after you bottom out against the Lions, the bounce back could be even more important for the Packers now going to the second half of the year. Yeah, absolutely. You you mentioned it. You mentioned Tennessee being kind of a, a strange team when you when you look at the numbers and sort of how things have been put together. They're ranked 31st in the league against the pass. I believe it's 272 yards per game allowed passing. But they've got nine interceptions. Yeah. They have eight different players. They have nine interceptions, and their team leader has two. They yep. have eight different guys who have intercepted a pass this year. They have They have 29 sacks, five different guys with at least three sacks, amongst that uh, amongst that pass rush unit but yet as you said they're ranked 31st in the league against the pass second in the league against the run it's going to be really interesting to see and it's going to be cold you know not bitterly cold but in the 20s it'll be the coldest game of the season so far certainly up here it'll be interesting to see just where and how the Packers can try to find some rhythm offensively because you know Buffalo was the number one ranked run defense and the Packers found a way to to yep. run the ball they just weren't able to finish drives and get points but they were able to run the ball against a pretty darn good run defense um Tennessee is coming in with a really good run defense but you know I the the Packers are going to have to with a defense that's got nine interceptions and 29 sacks you've got to, you've still got to be able to run the ball and stay and stay balanced and keep that defense honest because when defenses aren't honest and they can they can cheat, so to speak. That's when you get sacks and get takeaways. And the Packers have to be able to keep Tennessee's defense from being able to play like that. And that's going to be the key. And it's such a tough task, Mike, because you have to do it for 60 minutes. And obviously, everybody's in the same boat. Tennessee's going to be traveling on a short week to come to Green Bay for this one. So, But it's just... You and I, two weeks ago, it didn't work out against Detroit, but I remember sitting here with you saying, man, you went against Detroit, mm -hmm. and you went against Dallas. In a span of 14 days, you can change the entire trajectory of their season. They're still playing from behind here. Minnesota is still winning these close games late. As far as the division is concerned, you're a couple paces behind right now. In terms of the wild card, though, game and a half out. But you have to keep winning now. You have to build back after you lose five in a row. 
And this is a good opportunity to do so against a very talented Tennessee team. Yeah. One other thing I want to talk about before it gets away from us, because it's being talked about already in mid-November as the game of the year in the regular season in the NFL, that Minnesota at Buffalo game. I know prior to kickoff on Sunday afternoon, you know, we're in the press box and everybody's kind of keeping an eye on it, you know, watching bits and pieces of it and whatnot. Um, just an absolutely unbelievable game with the number of the, the, the number of big moments, momentum swings, and just and crazy things happening. And then afterward, there's all this officiating controversy with a completion that should have been overturned, and Buffalo had 12 men on the field when they stopped the Vikings by the goal line in overtime, all that kind of stuff. But oh, an absolutely wild, wild, wild game. And uh, um, two, th two things that I'll say about it. One is that <laughs> – say what you want to say about the Minnesota Vikings. They just keep finding a way. And there's something, there's something about the mojo that develops when, uh, when a team just finds ways to win the way they have. And the other thing is that I'll be interested to see because I've, I've, I've felt that I felt that when going into the Packers game in Buffalo, I felt the Buffalo bills were going to represent the AFC in the Super Bowl. And I still think, I still think on balance, they're the best team in the AFC. But how do the Buffalo Bills bounce back now? Two straight losses, one to a division rival in the Jets, another one where they're lamenting all kinds of mistakes that they made late in the game, whether you're talking about allowing the fourth and 18, the fumble by the goal line, the interception in overtime, all that kind of stuff. Josh Allen was the front runner for MVP, and suddenly in the last three games, he's got seven turnovers that are his responsibility. He's not the front runner for MVP anymore. He could, but he could still win it because yeah. he's capable of throwing 20 touchdown passes in the next month, and everybody's going to forget about the seven turnovers over the last three totally. weeks, right? So, I'm curious to see can Minnesota continue to sustain this? They've sustained it for basically two months now, winning all of these close games that come down to the wire. And how is Buffalo going to bounce back? Yeah, very peculiar schedule for Minnesota. That uh, you know they go now they you know I should say Minnesota for the Cowboys because they came up here and now they go to Minnesota. Yeah, now they go um, to Minneapolis and yeah. back to back uh, you know division games against the North on the road. Minnesota, I'm very interested. I, you know they're going to keep winning, um, and I you know I can't say anything bad about them, but. I'll be interested to see how that team reacts if they do face some adversity here at some point. If you're a good coach team, it doesn't matter what, what your talent is. It doesn't matter what you are. You win those games late in the fourth quarter. You find ways to you know, pull those things out. It says something about the coaching. Kevin O'Connell's done a, a fantastic job there so far this season. Yep. The Bills, Mike, I'm not a soothsayer. They may end up being the Super Bowl rep for the AFC. I said it when we left um, whatever landmark stadium. Not the Ralph. High Mark. High Mark. Whatever. High um, Mark. Landmark. Land Shark. Land Shark. They aren't paying us. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Um, when I said when I left this, <laughs> they just make too many mistakes. Um, they have an incredible coach in Sean uh, McDermott. I, I have confidence they're going to stay together and they'll be able to rally and pull this thing back. But I, I felt like last year that was the difference. They just that it, it just was those small things that Kansas City did just a little bit better and you know Kansas City still Kansas City. So, yeah. Very interested to see how that goes, but certainly um Green Bay Packers this isn't getting any easier in the NFC North cuz Minnesota keeps finding ways to win and I couldn't even tell you who you're supposed to cheer for this weekend between the Vikings and Cowboys. Yeah, I I mean yeah, I guess it's it's uh, it's take your pick right away. The the only good news the good news for the Packers is that both of them can't get a win. Yep. So uh, so and and for the Packers, it's like hey, you're four and six right now, and as I said last week on one of our videos, I don't remember which one, but you got to walk before you can run. Yep. Packers have to get to five hundred. If you can get to five hundred, whether it's at six and six or at seven and seven or whatever point you can get to 500 and get to the break even point, then you can start looking at what are your, what are your possibilities. Packers need two more wins right now to get to 500. And then we can start having those conversations. Big night on Thursday night. In addition to the game, this matchup with the Tennessee Titans, Green Bay Packers also will be honoring Leroy Butler yes. at halftime. Yes. His name will be the 28th name added to the hall of fame facade of all the uh, wonderful tremendous historic players that have been part of this iconic franchise be really neat to see him out there at halftime getting an honor that I felt has been rightfully due to him yeah. for the last 16 and years. And what more, what more appropriate name 
to finally be on the facade at Lambeau Field than the name of the man who invented the Lambeau Leap, right? I, it's, it's, because it's, it's tremendous. I love it. I, I, hope, I hope Leroy has a great night just as he enjoyed everything in Canton. I hope he enjoys everything about the special honor he's getting on Thursday. When I was a kid, my grandfather always talked to me about Henry Jordan and, and these I, you know fantastic Packers players, his favorites of the Lombardi era, right? It's pretty cool, Mike, that there's someday, good Lord shining on us, might have some grandkids at Lambeau Field someday pointing up to that spot up in the rafters, up, in, up on the facade saying, that was Leroy Butler. Many, many moons ago, that guy is the one that invented the Lambo Leap. He is somebody that is one of the most distinguishable, hospitable faces of this franchise, and I'm glad he's getting that honor. Yeah, no question about it. With that, we will call it a wrap on this edition of Packers Unscripted. Be sure to follow all of our coverage of the team. we got another game coming up right away. We will have everything from Thursday Night Football for you on Packers.com and all of the preview content leading up to it. For Wes, I am Mike. Thank you for tuning in, everybody. We'll see you next time.